please input your questions in the chat, indicating your name and affiliation and who the question is for. So then my colleagues will uh, select a few of the questions that we can ask the speakers and also we'll try to address all the questions post-meeting and circulate the answers with all of you. So uh, just a couple of minutes on every one of our uh, guest speakers for the session today. Uh, our first uh, keynote lecture will be given by uh, Dr. Dimitris Segevnos. Uh, the focus will be on the technical and economic drivers regarding brain management, as, as I have mentioned before. Dimitris is a, an assistant professor in circular value chains and sustainability at the Technical University of Delft. He has a strong interdisciplinary engineering background with a PhD in chemical engineering and postdoc in civil engineering. Uh, our next speaker uh, for the second keynote lecture would be Mr. Loic Carpenter. Uh, uh, he will provide a talk on the European perspective in Ukraine. Loic is the manager of the advocacy program of Europe, the European Association of the Innovative Water Sector. He also contributes to the communication of European research and innovation projects on behalf of Water Europe to the European institutions and manages the MEP Water Group Secretariat. Thank you, Loic. Um, and our final um, talk today will be given by Dr. Filiu Sempere Nager. He is a, a chemical engineer from the Universidad de Valencia in Spain, and he holds a PhD degree on development of a marketable biotechnology for the elimination of solvents in air emissions. So all of them are going to provide us um, with uh, very interesting talks on um, brines. So, without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and we will proceed with the first talk of the day given by Dimitris. So, Dimitris, please, if you could uh, put your um, slides on the screen. Of course. Please. I will just start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, give me seconds. I hope you can see my screen, Langa. Yes, so it is uploading now. Very clear and in full screen mode already. So thank Excellent. you. Excellent. So I'm starting then. Thank you very, very much for this kind introduction and for the invitation to join your webinar. Uh, as Blanca said, I'm Dimitris Xevianos. I'm an assistant professor at TQ Delft, and I will be speaking about technical and economic drivers regarding brain management. So my next slide is not that important anymore because Blanca gave this introduction for me. Uh, my, my background is said from the National Technical University of Athens mechanical, electrical, and chemical engineer. Maybe something that was important is that I moved to the private sector and I, I was in the startup community. And then I uh, joined the UDELF in 2017. And since January 2023, I'm an assistant professor there. Now, just for my PhD in chemical engineering, uh, one slide uh, about that, it was in the intersection about uh, within process design, circular economy, renewable energy. And the title was creating value out of seawater desalination brine. So it had to do exactly with brines through the recovery of water and salts using renewable energy sources. And in the follow-up activities that we will see also in the next slides, it was also the value for whom and the responsibility by whom. And I have been doing a lot of research with, with the actors. And here is just a picture now of the, the system for the brine treatment that I had designed and developed within my PhD with a capacity of two cubic meters per day. So moving now to the outline of uh, this presentation, I start with, with uh, where do brines originate from? and what can be recovered, what are the different technical approaches to brine valorization, and finally, what are the economic drivers for the brine valorization. Started with the origination of the brines. Um, I use here a slide that I, uh, I like a lot, uh, a definition, and it comes from uh, WSSTP, now it's Water Europe, uh, where LOIC also is working for, and it dates back to February 2012. They had said that brine can be defined as water, which has nearly reached saturation point with dissolved salt, so more than 50 grams per liter, and usually, but not exclusively, sodium chloride. And then be below 50 grams per liter, they just say about the industrial wastewater, the brackish water between 0 0.5 and 30 grams per liter, and saline water from 30 to 50. And above 50, it is a brine. This is a definition coming from, from Water Europe back in 2012. 
and from the same uh, publication, they said about the brine emissions in Europe. And what they stated is that publicly available information for, for brine emissions from specific industrial sectors is limited. And the case is still the same. It has not changed since 2012. And what they did, and uh, I will show some results later on from my research, is that the predominant salt discharge is chloride. So it was used as a proxy to map the brine emissions. And I did that also in the Zero Brine project. This is a project of Horizon 2020 that has been completed. And I will show you some of the results for the origin of brines. And how did I did my research? I used the European Pollutant Release and Transfer Register, the EPRTR, which covers 28,000 industrial facilities from 65 economic activities and 91 pollutants. And one of those pollutants is from the inorganic group, and that is the chloride releases, as we discussed from Water Your publication. So here, uh, from 2018, one of my publications, I just mapped and uh, quantified how many facilities in Europe are emitting chloride releases, 17 million tons per year. And you can see, where does this brine come from? From chemical industry mostly which is with, with blue, followed by waste management, mineral industry, energy industry, and then the others, which you can see with a bar on the right from the pie, it is production of metals, production of paper, animal and vegetable products. And what I did is that then I went one step further to see that in the Netherlands, because we have a very nice uh, register there, which is called Emissi Registrati. And then I mapped all this uh, brine effluents, 277 facilities, 870 kilotons of chlorides per year. Apart from the mapping, let's see what do we learn from that. Here are the four main sectors that for the Netherlands now. Huh? Uh, chemical industry is again by 61% the, the biggest, followed by salt mining industry, 29%. But the interesting part for the chemical industry is something that you will see also then in one of my next slides. Here is from, for Nats 2 region, I think, uh, illustration in the Netherlands. Where do you have the chemical industries and 54 facilities with you can see the chloride releases here now what i did is that after zero brine we um, had a brine recycling in the chemical industry project that you will see in the second part of my presentation so what are the different technical approaches to brine valorization now i will structure that within uh, this project that is currently ongoing uh, it is a horizon 2020 project called water mining the title is Next Generation Water Smart Management Systems, Large-Scale Demonstrations for a Circular Economy Society. It's a large project of 19 million euro involving 38 partners from 12 countries, and we are coordinating that with the UDELFT. Now, the concept is that we see water throughout the value chain, so either as a resource or as a product, and if a product is a consumable or a durable good. And we have established three lines of research and demonstration. Seawater desalination brines is the sea mining, Urban wastewater is the urban mining, and then in, uh, industrial wastewater is the industrial mining. And I'm going to give you now the examples of the technologies from the sea mining and the industrial mining group. Starting from the sea mining, here is a demonstration that we have done in Lampedusa Island. Lampedusa is a small island below Sicily in Italy, and here is the technology, the treatment train. So we have multiple technologies, as you can see, to recover um, those resources from the seawater desalination brine. And I will just guide you through now. We start with double pass nanofiltration. And what we do, this is um, a technology supplied by Lentech, uh, that's SME. We separate uh, the brine into um, a permeate and retentate stream. And I will just uh, discuss both now. Starting with a retentate, with a brine coming from the nanofiltration, we have the multiple feed plug flow reactor. It's a technology patented by the University of Palermo and they recover magnesium hydroxide with 99% purity and calcium hydroxide. Now, downstream, we have the eutectic freeze crystallization, which is a technology developed by us at CU Delft, and we are recovering sodium sulfate. And further downstream, we have the electrodialysis by polar membranes, where we recover hydrochloric and caustic soda. Now, in our case, we just use that internally, but uh, you can just also use it externally. Now, if we go to the, uh, the, the, the upper part, in the permeate, we have the high pressure nanofiltration and the multiple effect distillation, which you can use one or the other, depending if you want waste heat or electricity to drive the processes. And downstream, we have the evaporation ponds or another crystallizer. So you can see here the complete treatment train that we have already demonstrated in water mining. 
Uh, you can see that this is pre-industrial scale, so it's not uh, a low TRL, but it's 7, 8 already. And I will just now move to the industrial mining cases. We have in the chlorine sector in the Netherlands now uh, the application. You can see here a map of Rotterdam port where the chlorine uh, sector is um, uh, focusing. So Nobian is the company that produces the chlorine and they have three chlorine users downstream. One of them being, you see here Hexion, now it's called Westlake Epoxy. And what we do is that we have a full circularity, so we purify um, the stream and we get it back to, to Nobian. Uh, the impact uh, re reduction by 30% of water consumption, uh, energy consumption reduction, 25 megawatt hours, and of course, kilotons of CO2 are indirectly saved. Full circularity, we have circular economy business model innovation through chemical easing and no discharge. Um, now, this is how it looks like. So Nubian in the value chain holds also the salt production and the chlorine production and downstream is Westlake Epoxy. And what we do is that we purify the brine and we give, uh, take it back to Nubian. And the TRL is seven. I'm not really allowed to give a lot of details about the technologies, but maybe we can discuss this if there is any question in the Q&A. What are the economic drivers for brine valorization now? My last part of the presentation recovery of secondary raw materials, um, which in certain cases, or in many cases, can be the main product recovered, with water being a byproduct. And I don't mean that in terms of volume or mass, but in terms of value that you can capture. Reduction of environmental fees. Sometimes there are cases that they're paying a lot of fees, and this can be a driver to adopt a circular economy solution. Creation of new business opportunity. What do I mean here is that, um, there are industries that want to expand their production capacity, but they're being limited by the effluent limits. And we had such a case study in, in Zero Brain project. And then establishing local value and supply chains, safeguarding access to raw materials. And this is also very relevant for us in water mining. We have in islands where they are sourcing um, chemicals or other materials outside um, their territory, they had experienced disruption of the supply chains affecting the economic activities. So that would be a very nice way from seawater to get these materials from. Conclusions. Um, brines can originate from industrial processes as well as from seawater desalination plants. Now for the industrial pro uh, processes, uh, chloride releases can be used as a proxy to get some insights per sector. And we can do that by using the emission registers. I showed to you the, how you can use the EPRTR or emission registrati for us in the Netherlands. But still information in industrial urban emissions is limited. A considerable amount of projects is focusing on recovering resources from brines. For example, I showed to you the zero brine and the water mining project, of course, Waste to Coke is another one, over the past years, reflecting also the call for enab enabling a circular water economy. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Ah, I want to stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Am I in time, Blanca? Yes. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for the very uh, enlightening presentation. And yes, you were spot on with the time. So thanks Super. a lot. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Loic. Um, so please, Loic, if you can. Um, Upload your presentation. Yes. And turn on your camera. Yes, so we can see you now. And um, yeah, and it has been mentioned in the chat if you could uh, remove the height note at the bottom of your slide, that would be very helpful. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. The floor is yours, Loic. Perfect. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will start to present quickly Water Europe. Uh, so uh, Water Europe is a, a recognized voice and promoter of water-related innovation uh, in Europe. So we gather 260 members now uh, from 32 countries, and uh, we gather the full value change of the water sector, uh, like multinational cooperation, utility research centers, uh, but also large water industry uh, user like Coca-Cola or uh, solution providers and SMEs. Um, we have two uh, specificity for the European landscape. The first one, we are a purpose-driven multi-stakeholder association. As I just explained, we, we have this uh, the full value change. 
uh, public and private solution uh, provider but challenge owners. And the second one is we are a value-based organization. So we have developed in 2014 a vision called the Water Smart Society. And when we advocate who uh, promote collaboration, it's always when uh, member interest meet with uh, this vision. Um, so to the next slide to explain you a little bit what is uh, the vision. So the Water Smart Society is a concept that we initiated some uh, years ago now, and uh, we just updated uh, in March 23 during the UN Water Conference the concept to really put at the center the value of water. Uh, you have three main objectives, uh, which is to uh, achieve water resilience, security, and sustainability. And to do that, we identify five areas of investment and innovation uh, of course circular water so it's to close the loop uh, the water loops to uh, multiple water so to diversify the different sources of water including reuse water and cast water which is important in the context of brine management uh, digital water but also inclusive governance and resilience water so mainly uh, for uh, infrastructure um, so you, you can see on the, on the slide the definition, it's slightly uh, different from the previous one, uh, but mainly to integrate the demographic change and climate impact, but also uh, to really put the value of water at the heart of these uh, um, definitions. Um, so when uh, we so now when we enter more in the political landscape or, or the or the political activities um, in Water Europe, we when we advocate we we base our uh, activities on the vision. It's part of our societal responsibility, but we try also to be evidence based and technological neutral. Um, and here we have several projects entering um, uh, in this process to provide inputs, but also we check that it's financially and economically sustainable. So that we have the outcome of the project, but also a double check internally by the different segment. And um, if if we speak about Brian, Brian is a little bit everywhere, as Dimitri uh, showcased in his presentation uh, before. Uh, you have uh, Brian in textile, coal industry, chemis, chemical industry also, but also for drinking water productions. And uh, you have, in fact, several legislation touching uh, this point. So, for example, the industrial emission directive, um, taxonomy for financial uh, aspects, the circular economy action plan, uh, but also you can follow up on the implementation of this legislation through the different European expert group. So, you have one mainly uh, generally for each key legislation, like the industrial emission directive, the drinking water directive, and you have some specific platform like the zero pollution stakeholder platform. Here I will just zoom in two um, legislations uh, to give you some insight and go beyond the classical path. Uh, the first one is about the soil monitoring law that uh, the legislative proposal was just released last week by the European Commission and the strategy also, uh, where they mention, for example, the restoration of soil in Europe. And so here you do not have binding objective, but more an objective to monitor and report contaminated sites across Europe and one of them um, that they, they target is uh, salinized soil across Europe. So it's really important here to, to, to follow this type of the political development or legislative development because it can uh, have an impact on brine uh, disposal and management. They also make the link in the strategy with the industrial emission directive. I will come back to that a little bit la later and also all the different uh, research and innovation program, which are really important uh, as an input for the legislation. So Dimitri was mentioning zero brine, water mining, for example. This type of project provide to the European Commission inputs and political recommendations that the EU institution will take into consideration when they are developing uh, legislations. Um, and here, Allow me to touch a little bit about the industry emission directive and one good practice that we had with zero brine. So this project now it's closed, uh, but the provided political uh, recommendation and uh, during at this moment, the breath document for the textile industry uh, was under revision. And uh, we were able uh, to include the outcome of the project in 
uh, the document for best available techniques. Um, and here it has an impact after on the deployment in the of the technology uh, across Europe. Um, but also, if, if we turn a little bit the, the prism on that, uh, you have an interest also uh, when you touch the current barriers or opportunities. Dimitri was presenting the economic uh, opportunities or drivers. Uh, you have another one, it's the administrative burden that you can have when you emit emission into water. Uh, in some country, you have a, uh, a quantity, a load, and if you need to, to increase this quantity, uh, you need to, to request new administrative authorization and it costs time, it costs money for the companies. So investing in, in technology or uh, resource recovery, it can help a lot. Um, also, uh, you have uh, another challenge. It might be a driver, so at the same time a barrier. It's an energy efficiency directive. Um, this one was just uh, uh, requested by European commissions. Uh, and here, the push for all the industry to be uh, carbon neutral uh, and energy efficient. Uh, so you really need to consider that as uh, this aspect, uh, and I'm here considering, for example, the desalinization processes, which is highly intensive in terms of energy, and um, it can impact, uh, in fact, the deployment of uh, such uh, technology. On, on the other side, you have the reuse regulation uh, for agricultural purposes that can be an incentive to desalinization uh, in some region to provide uh, drinking water through desalinization for their household area and then reuse this uh, water after for agricultural purposes, for example. And the last point uh, that I would like to, to say is more a little bit bigger here. Uh, it's the next commission program. We have the election coming up in June. We are already working in Brussels on uh, the next program of the European Commission. Uh, we have some element that resource recovery, strategic autonomy are key wording in this context and uh, the different processes and technology that are linked to brine's management uh, are uh, considering resource recovery. Um, and that might be a new hook, a new opportunity for investment or to unlock new um, opportunities for business uh, or technology. Um, uh, I will skip this slide because Dimitri did a very good job, so I don't need to go too much on this example, and you know far more better than me. Um, but you asked me what is the best uh, option uh, for Brian uh, to prepare this um, uh, this presentation and I will conclude a little bit here with uh, uh, an article done by uh, a professor during the University of Las Palmas uh, de Gran Canaria. Uh, he explained that um, in fact the most important is to have a strategic approach uh, for brine management and, and I do agree here that uh, water or water related to be are really fragmented uh, in Europe and the solution needs to be adapted to the local situations. Um, and it's why it's important to have water-oriented living lab, for example, but also the important to maintain uh, technology neutrality in the legislations. Um, you, you cannot push for one best technology, uh, in fact, because sometimes the best technology will be different from one region to another, from the north and the south. And uh, if you check the the seven parameter that it put for a strategic uh, approach about brine management and particularly in Las Canarias um, or, or in uh, island uh, regions, um, you, you see uh, the, the red uh, boxes are touching several legislation. So circular economy, you have the circular economy action plan, you have um, uh, also the um, uh, resource recovery um, resource recovery action plan that is coming up uh, reducing co2 you have the energy efficiency directive the industrial emission directive and the two first one you have all the maritime uh, dossier uh, coming from dg mari and above all you have of course the water framework directive or the urban wastewater treatment directive also so all these type of legislation are really important. The legislative landscape is also fragmented, uh, but it can open new uh, opportunity. Uh, but I will say that the most important is really to remain technological neutral and to have the full picture 
when you start to uh, to discuss about brine management and disposal. Uh, and I think I'm also uh, good with the timing. Yes, Loic, you were also spot on. Thank you very much for your time management and also to, for providing this uh, digested overview of the current policies in Europe, which is uh, always really useful for us to, to see. Uh, I, I take the key message from you uh, to look at looking at more appropriate technologies rather than the best technologies. There's not a best technology that is going to fit all. Totally agree with that. Okay, uh, so our next speaker uh, and final speaker is going to be Feliu. Um, so Feliu is going to provide us an overview and the highlights of um, the work we are doing at Life Waste to Core from the coordinator perspective. Uh, thank you. Your slides are already on the screen. The floor is yours for you. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, welcome to this to this meeting. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, the context of why we we are doing uh, life ways to go, the problem to solve, which our uh, previous speaker already pointed out, and the previous research and development projects, which were the seed of, of this one, okay? To continue with the overview and the car current status of the of life ways to go uh, project. Finally, we will outline the transferability and what we want to, to achieve after, after the project, okay? Well, the problem to solve is uh, there is a high coagulant consumption worldwide uh, with a value of over $7 million uh, per year, with 70% application in urban wastewater treatment plants, but also a high application in industrial uh, wastewater treatment with a continuous price increments and which require also outsourcing outsourcing outside the, the wastewater treatment plants. Big uh, coagulant consumption is uh, expected to increase over the coming years, also related to the more stringent uh, effluent concentration in, in wastewater treatment, especially regarding phosphorus content. Uh, regarding brine disposals, uh, Dimitri has already uh, gave some, some numbers and indeed only from the desalination plants there are uh, 142 million cubic meters per day with 80% of the production and release of these uh, brines are below 10 kilometers from saline water bodies. But 15% of this brine disposal is 50 kilometers away from saline water bodies, especially in countries like China, the United States, and, and Spain. There is, as mentioned, a growing trend in valorization because these uh, brines pose an environmental problem. And normally, uh, although uh, not on a high level, there are uh, land applications and irrigation of salt tolerant crops saline uh, aquaculture or farming of tolerant uh, species also restoration of saltwater habitats and energy generation by solar gradient ponds as well as industrial uses as feedstocks so there is an increasing concern on increasing the sustainability of of brine disposal being research and development a hot topic as we have seen so the to point to the concept of of our previous research and development projects uh, is the valorization of brines and metal wastes into coagulants to be used in wastewater treatment either urban and industrial using an electrolytical technology these previous works were carried out by global Aluminium together with idime which is also a partner of life waste to go and imply laboratory reactor from one liter and also a pilot scale reactor scaling up the previous results to of 100 liter capacity just to mention the electrolysis uh, the concept is to apply a continuous electrical current to two metal electrodes immersed in a solution to cause a non-spontaneous chemical change if we use an, an anode an electrode of steel we will be producing a, a iron-based coagulant, which is a substitute of commercial chloric uh, iron chloride. 
for, uh, iron salts. And also if we use an aluminum um, electrode, uh, we will substitute the commercial pack using an um, aluminum-based uh, coagulant. What we do using brines is uh, taking to profit the higher conductivity, which allows to apply lower voltages. So then we will end up with a lower electrical consumption than if we use other type of solutions. Some previous results, uh, we seek and selected uh, several suppliers of, of metal waste and also selected different metal wastes as an alternative to commercial electrodes, as, as we see here in the, in the below image. Also, we characterize different uh, uh, brines from the drink, from drinking water facilities as global onium is implemented in integral water cycles. So we also uh, uh, operate drinking water facilities. And we treated these metal waste and brines at laboratory scale in IDMES facility with the uh, reactor that we see in, in this picture. Finally, after the previous uh, results at the lab scale, we designed, constructed, and operated a 100-liter uh, pilot plant unit, which we see in this in this picture, which was installed in a wastewater treatment facility in Canet. And the results that we obtained regarding metal concentrations is that we were evaluating the metal concentration respect the electrolysis time that we see in these two graphs for iron-based coagulants on the left and aluminum-based on the right. And we applied different current densities together with electrolysis time, reaching the higher concentrations, obviously, at higher uh, at electrolysis time of 60, of 60 minutes for iron, although the optimum value we um, identified that it was uh, at, at lower concentration because it was not exponential. And in the below graphs, we see the energy consumption per kilogram of metal for iron and aluminium-based coagulants for the two different type of brines that we treated, where we see that, as expected, the lower con energy consumption was obtained for the brines with higher conductivity, 11 millisieverts per centimeter. We tested these coagulants in, in yard test applications and in yard tests, and we observed how, as a tertiary treatment, we decreased for both types of coagulants significantly the uh, phosphorus content in the treated wastewater from around 2 ppm to a value of 0 0.5 milligrams phosphorus per liter for the higher uh, dose of. of either iron or aluminum here on the right. So with these good results, we decided to scale up this concept in this, where it came, the Life Waste to Cope proposal, which was awarded and started in October of 2021 with the partners, as mentioned before, IDME, uh, Technical Institute, Joviar, which is a, a small medium company of the metal sector, I utilities, which is organizing this webinar, and also the water utilities, Aquafin in Belgium, and Global Omnium Medio Ambiente. The overview and current status of the project started with the obtention of the administrative permits, the design, construction, and commissioning of the prototype. Now we are currently in the optimization of the prototype operation with the coagulant production based uh, on treating different brines and applying different conditions. And also uh, we are expecting once we uh, finish to produce the, the, the coagulants at the optimized operational conditions to apply them during yard test. And finally, once the system is, is optimized to validate the coagulants in a urban wastewater treatment plant in Gandia, here in Spain, replicate the system by sending the technology to Wulpen in Belgium, and also operate the plant in an industrial wastewater treatment plant in Joviar, which is the industrial partner. ISLE is leading the market access and exploitation of results, and then the actions are completed by the environmental and 
and socioeconomical assessments, dissemination and communication uh, activities, and also the monitoring of the impact of the project's actions and the coordination of the project itself. Here we have the, a picture of the, of the constructed uh, pilot plant and also the human machine interface and a short video with the commissioning of the, of the installation. We just started to, to operate this month of June. And as mentioned, it will be installed in three sites. Uh, the first one is Gandia, which is a urban wastewater treatment plant located next to the Serpis River. Now it's not discharged discharge into the river, but it's expected in the future to be, to be an option as it happened in the past, where we will expect uh, lower uh, limits on phosphorus emission. This wastewater treatment plant receives brine from three industrial companies, which are value of around 25 cubic meters per week, brines with different uh, conductivity values, and from cleaning, textile, and disinfection products uh, companies. Later on in Wulpen in Belgium, uh, we will install the the plant in this wastewater treatment facility, which is indeed located next to a drinking water facility, but by saying next is 10 meters away, which discharges around 14,000 cubic meters brines per week to the North Sea without valorizing them. Brines with a lower conductivity than the industrial ones we receive in Gandia. And finally, Joviar, uh, is generating brine for the production process with a smaller amount of 1.5 cubic meters brines per week, but with a high conductivity value. The initial results, we checked the purity of the scrap metals used as electrodes, as, it, as we see in these pictures, where we saw that the, the the metal wastes contain a high purity of both aluminium and iron, indeed sometimes higher than, than commercial uh, electrodes. And the first results that we have, comparing to the previous one on the left, we have the ones on the right. We apply in different current densities. We are increasing the metal concentration from previous projects. We are reaching values around 1,000 milligrams of aluminium, which was one of the objectives to try to uh, valorize as much as possible every cubic meter of brine into a coagulant. And also because of the high uh, conductivity, around 40 millisieverts per centimeter of the brine treated, we are also decreasing the energy uh, consumption per kilogram of, of aluminium. Just to mention that these are values of the uh, applied current into the, into the rectifier, into the electrolytic reactor. So, uh, as said, currently the previous results are being optimized and uh, with lower energy consumption than, than obtained previously. And what we are looking for, we are looking for to, to test different type of brine, process them in the demo plant. We are also looking for to apply the alternative coagulants that we will be producing, treating different wastewaters. And for that, we look for networking with different stock stakeholders and we take profit also of this webinar to encourage all of you to contact us via email, this address, our webpage, or via our social networks. Finally, as conclusions, uh, brines and metal wastes has been correctly valorized from previous projects and scale up as the electrolytic reactor to, to this 1,000 cubic meter reactor that we are running in Life Waste to Co. And we next steps is to scale up the coagulant application to be tested after the jar test uh, experiments, and we look for networking with stakeholders, as I just mentioned. And finally, just to as a nice picture, a new we are also having visitors in our electrolytic pilot plant, as we see with this. I don't remember now the name, the Snapdragon, I think it it was. And with this, thank you for your attention, and I'm open to to any questions that that you might have. Okay, thank you, Feliu, and thank you for the photo of the new partner in the project. You're welcome. Uh, 
it shows that the, um, the system really is uh, environmentally friendly. Um, it is great. Okay. Uh, yeah, Chris, thank you. Uh, Damsel Fly. Uh, so this is the name. <laughs> thank you, Chris. So then we are going to move into the next stage of um, of this uh, webinar and we'll start with a session of questions and answers. We are doing really well with the time. So what we are going to do is we are going to go one round uh, with one question for each one of the speakers, selecting for the questions that have been asked. And then if we have time, we'll go on the second round. Uh, so please, Eleonora, if you want to start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Blanca. Um, yeah, we can start with a question for Feliu, maybe. So from Chris, what would be the cost of the coagulants produced with our technology compared to the conventional ones, you know? Exactly. Well, that's the, we tested in the, in previous projects that for uh, aluminum-based coagulants, that was competitive uh, respect to PAC, which has a higher price than iron-based commercial coagulants. In this project, that's an objective of the life ways to go because we have to scale up also the, the, the production of the coagulants and take into account also the manufacturer process of the, of the electrolytic reactor. So that's a, a point to be evaluated. And also inside the project, what we want to do is to compare uh, commercial coagulants with our ways to go because we only we don't have we have a mix of species of of iron which we expect that we can we can improve the that we can treat the wastewater at, at different doses that the the commercial coagulants and also we have versatility in the in the type of coagulant produced because we can mix aluminium and iron uh, salts to see which is the the performance of of this new mixer so at the end of the project we expect to have uh, results because indeed one of the objective is to to be more competitive than than commercial coagulants yeah. thank you value um, moving on to um, Dimitris. Uh, we were wondering, uh, you know, you have highlighted a few projects with a focus on brines and you mentioned a few uh, technologies with high TRLs. So we're wondering, do you know what's next for this technology? Have you seen a market upside for these or are you also looking to for a global market? So what what is the next plan for this? Thanks, Eleonora, for the question. Um, yes. And definitely in water mining, we are looking into that because water mining is um, an innovation action, which means that it is targeting the market. And we are also focusing a lot on the social embedding. So we are looking in close collaboration with uh, stakeholders and communities of practice, as we have named that in the project, how we can really um, select technologies that can uh, uh, provide what they need uh, according to their objectives and interests locally. Um, as a, as, a, as, a, as a case, I could mention Cyprus. Uh, we had a workshop uh, in last May, and we discussed, okay, you have this sea mining concept uh, with seven or eight technologies that you have demonstrated in Lampedusa, but then uh, what is applicable there locally? And what we did is that we looked in the different supply and value chains, the different salts, the different chemicals, and then we realized that not all of, the, all of these salts and chemicals are relevant for this economy. So then we said, okay, out of these technologies, of the eight, then the three of them are really applicable. And then we looked into specifically what are the market specifications and quantities that they need locally. Because if you just go for zero liquid discharge in seawater desalination brines, you get mountains of salts and chemicals. And for the local economy, that is not useful, of course. So there are a couple of examples that we looked into, and mostly caustics and acids are really nice for them because they have different market applications so we looked into that with the stakeholders and then we selected some technologies for that electrodialysis bipolar could be an example for that perfect very clear thank you um loic yes there you are um so we wanted to ask you uh, if you know what is the best way in your opinion that for example a, a project like waste to coag can inform policy making particularly 
following your comments about the, the fact that the next EC program uh, and the Water Europe are already working on it. So um, what is the best way to inform policy according to you? Um, it's a big question. Um, the, the legislative, not, not the legislative, the political process right now is quite complex for, for, uh, for the next program because in fact all the member states uh, can provide input, but also the European Commission, the Parliament, the European political group, the national political group also. Um, so the a project like uh, West to Code, uh, it's to go directly, I think, to its local policymaker uh, or the MEP that are really important uh, on this topic right now. Um, and and the most important is to come with short policy brief. Uh, that is really, really important. We, we see some pol um, some policy brief from the project where more than four pages is far too much for a policymaker. It's very good for the European Commission, but it's completely useless for a member of the parliament. Um, and you really need to connect with uh, the key topic uh, or the, the hot topic that they have right now. So for example, the autonomy, uh, strategic autonomy, uh, resource recovery, uh, the energy crisis. Uh, this summer we will have the water scarce, uh, water issue. So, in one way, is very good for us to make the connection with that and to communicate at the right time in a simple way. Normally, it should work well. But uh, for the next program, it's quite complex uh, because you have to uh, a lot of stakeholders, and it's uh, more than a full time job. Thank you. Um, Feliu, going back to you, um, we were wondering, so how the, uh, can the life waste to quark solution affect the current scenario for brine management? So what do you think um, the solution can have an impact on brine management? Uh, well, thanks. I, yes, I think it can impact, uh, indeed, depending as, as Dimitri mentioned, uh, every solution has to be adapted at to, to every to every case, but currently uh, the waste disposal of brines uh, might affect to the number of wastewater treatment plants that can receive this 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 waste. Okay, with the good point that they are not discharged uh, directly to to the sea, as in some facilities is made now, uh, with a high concentration because it's a a fast release with with life ways to go we will release we will convert that into brines into coagulants but like we will homogenize it will not be a peak release of of brines so more wastewater treatment plants maybe can get permits to to receive and treat brines and also industrial uh, recycles with uh, industrial wastewater treatment plants they they can receive the brines which i think sometimes they do now but they are not valorized in, in it. so i think that that could change the the way uh, brines could be managed especially for decentralized wastewater treatment plants which which might be close to industrial uh, areas with brine management for industrial processes. Yeah. Thank you, Felio. Uh, for Dimitris, we also have a question from Wilfred on the chat, and um, he was asking about energy reduction in your technology. So, yes, uh, with a comment, I expect that from raw material into Nobion to waste at the waste lake, the energy reduces, but entropy increases. So, uh, recovering that could cost energy. What do you think? Um, Thanks for the question. So this is, of course, per case study and uh, it differs. But if we take the example of um, of Nobian and, and Westlake, uh, what happens is that you get uh, the salt through solution mining in the northern part of, of the Netherlands. Uh, I think it is called Delfzeel, the, the, the area there. And then you have to put water uh, underground and then you have to get uh, a solution out you have to put energy to make it at a solid form you transport that then in, in 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 the southern part then you dilute again with water so all this water coming in and out and you're removing by energy 
input that is not really um, necessary for, for the for the process downstream. So what we did, what we do now is that you get in the same neighborhood because chlorine is no longer uh, possible to transport in the Netherlands because of a, of a law. In the neighborhood, you have the chlorine producer and the chlorine consumer, and the chlorine consumer, the chlorine use stream is at a, a nice concentration level, let's say, around I think 12% or so TDS. So then you just uh, we just use waste heat first of all, and we make it exactly at um, the concentration level that they need after you purify from organics to get it back to 20% then TDS. So that you can save, this part you can save because you do that uh, locally there. And of course you have the energy uh, of transportation that you no longer need that uh, because it is the northern part and then it is the southern part of the Netherlands as well. Thank you, Dimitris. Um, I think we have uh, a time for one short question, maybe uh, to Thaliu. Um, and what, if you know, um, can you treat different type of brines in this type of technology uh, with the life waste to coag solution? Have you tested different type of brines? What are your plans for this? Uh, yes, uh, indeed, we in Gandia are receiving three different type of brines. In previous projects, we tested two different types. And as far as it's a, bi a brine suitable to be discharged especially in wastewater treatment plants, especially avoiding uh, toxic metal content. So that would not, uh, we will not foresee uh, any any problem because what, what we want is the metal from the, from the electrode uh, it itself. It, the, the brine is the medium to release the, the metal and avoid a high energy consumption which in an industrial scale would be provided by solar energy. That's the, that's the objective, to monitor the energy consumption uh, very closely and, and design a, a renewable, renewable energy, energy system to, to fit the, the, the prototype. Thank you, Valio. Okay, so with this, I think that we are going to close the question and uh, answer session. Thank you very much for all the questions being asked and your responses, Feliu Dimitris and Loic. Um, from my point, I always like to think about what is the take home message that uh, after I listen to any webinar. So I'm sure that for each one of you uh, on the audience, you'll have a different keynote key message that you are taking home. I'm going to share with you the ones I'm, I'm, I'm picking up and see if there is any um, overlap with what you take. So for me, it is the added value of the project is clear, uh, using an, an innovative approach uh, to produce coagulants. Uh, there is a new market opportunity. So more wastewater treatment plants in Europe and possibly globally will be able to manage plants in a different way. Uh, there is no best technology solution, and this has been, uh, I think, highlighted by the three speakers that fits all. And what we need is to identify what is appropriate and maybe to adapt it to the local uh, needs. Uh, and finally, um, something which is uh, very important, particularly for the activities we develop within the project, is that it seems that there is a market for this type of solutions. It seems that there is an appetite. Uh, particularly looking at the aspects of resource recovery, not only looking at the brine, but also uh, the water, as it has been uh, highlighted, even if the focus was the brine. But we need to consider the global picture. We need to look at the, uh, at the uh, barriers and also the enablers. So policy making, uh, sometimes we look at it as a barrier, but we have also to look at it as an enabler. And I'm taking uh, with me um, homework that Loic has indicated, we have to think about uh, how we best can engage with policy making. They need our input and we need uh, the barriers to be transformed into uh, enablers. So we have to think about policy briefs, not only providing the technology merits of all the solutions that we produce. So this is my take home message. Uh, as I said, I'm sure that you, many of you will have uh, these similar or others. Uh, which is uh, which would be great. So we have been collected uh, a few questions. Maybe we then have answers to address all the questions. Uh, we are going to share uh, the presentation uh, through the 
channels uh, that we have. So we'll use our social media. Uh, the recording of this presentation, you will see it available in a few days in our YouTube channel for the project. But also please keep following us on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, our webpage, and of course, email us with all the questions. You will have all the li links in our webpage. And if you sh um, search for live ways to coac, you will see that. So thank you very much all for your participation. We are spot on on time. So I'm very pleased about that as well, because I know that you are all very busy. Thank you very much to our speakers. A, a big round of applause, um, digital ones and, and real ones. Uh, lots of process. So uh, I hope everybody has been really satisfied with the outcomes. Thanks a lot and have a good uh, rest of the day and a good week. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.